Now, we've already discussed load in relationship to tendon, but let's look at it in just a bit more detail. We've already said that the frictional force of the tendon is proportional to the load applied. But we need some load to flex the finger. We have to pull with the muscle on the tendon in order to have the tendon move proximally relative to the bed. There are two distinctly different sources that create resistance and thereby increase load. The intrinsic resistance, or if you will, friction, has to do, as we've discussed, with the nature of the repair, the status location of the pulley, any gapping, and also the, the actual location of the tendon. But what we have not discussed is the extrinsic resistance, which can increase the load necessary to flex the finger. These factors include stiff joints, adherence of the soft tissue, or a bulky, thick scar or other uh, soft tissue impediment, presence of edema, and muscle tendon unit tightness. All flexor tendons will have some external resistance present, if for no other reason than the postoperative edema. But in many flexor tendon uh, repairs, we see all of these factors present simultaneously and perhaps overlapping one another. Now we must pull on the tendon to achieve glide or motion so there's not adherence to the bed. But our goal is to neither break the repair or create gapping. We have no control over the gap at rest or the gap created by the suture that is not tight enough but we do have some control over the amount of stress we apply which can elongate any gapping. We know that if we move a digit with a flexor tendon repair through several cycles of passive flexion that that will greatly reduce the resistance to any subsequent motion. So it is our responsibility to decrease the work of flexion by first of all decreasing the resistance to passive motion. This is particularly true if the patient is on an early active protocol. You still want to precede the active flexion with passive motion. In this chicken model, it was six cycles that were required to significantly reduce the resistance to passive motion. That then reduces the resistance to active motion. In addition to passive range of motion, there are other ways that we can minimize the amount of resistance created and thus decrease the load required. One of the key approaches is to position the hand so that during either passive or active flexion there is not maximum tension placed on the extensors by virtue of the position. We will talk about this in more detail momentarily. Our other responsibility is to assure that edema is at a minimal level because that alone can significantly increase the resistance to active finger flexion. Amadio introduced the term safe zone. This zone is the difference between the amount of force you need to move a tendon because we have to have some power to get the tendon to move, and the amount of force that either creates gapping or rupture. So there's a balance between enough force and too much force. Now I'm using the word force interchangeably with load because load is really talking about the amount of force or pull on the tendon. Amadio illustrated the safe zone as being that position between the repair friction and the initial gapping. 
And in this illustration, he correlated the appropriate uh, maneuvers of the tendon in relationship to the safe zone. What is missing, however, for me is the element of time. Because as time proceeds and the tendon heals and is stronger and stronger, the safe zone significantly increases. In addition, the safe zone can be altered by multiple factors, one of which is the strength of the suture. Place and hold is a technique frequently used by therapists with a view toward minimizing the amount of tension the muscle needs to generate in order to pull the finger into flexion. As important as this is that passive range of motion has preceded the place and hold so that the resistance to the holding is minimized. Growth has contributed to the literature by suggesting this pyramid of progressive force application. You can see that whether the wrist is protected or unprotected is a significant factor. As one moves through the different maneuvers to increase the resistance to the repaired tendon. But keep in mind that this is not a pyramid that is applied early in the postoperative rehabilitation because there is little effect on the tendon strength of the repair or the motion by loading early on. So what are our conclusions about load? We want to decrease resistance to the load by passive range of motion being applied cyclically before active motion. We want to be aware of the position in the orthosis and be sure that edema is minimal. We want to identify and stay within the safe zone of each individual patient based on all the variables we're aware of for that specific tendon repair. In 2000, Strickland looked at suture strength as it relates to the force needed for various uh, types of active motion. The differing blue lines show us the point at which there is a rupture with a two-strand, a four-strand, and a six-strand repair when force is applied to it, the force in grams. You can see that the amount of force needed does change over time and that, as we previously discussed, any repair will be somewhat weaker at the one to three week range and then begins to strengthen as we move towards six weeks. This graph with yellow and white shows us now how many grams are needed for strong grip, light active motion, and passive motion. In other words, how much force is needed to move the finger against resistance. If we superimpose these two graphs, it becomes somewhat visually confusing, but if you're able to just sort the blue away from the white and yellow, the most important thing we want to look at is where these lines cross over one another. Here, for example, is a two-strand repair strength as it is associated with light active motion. And we can see that that repair strength at the one week and three week points is below the amount of force needed to move a finger through light active flexion. This would suggest that the two strand re repair would not be strong enough to begin early active motion. Here we see a crossover with the six strand repair and strong grip. Even though in the beginning, at the time of repair, it appears that a six strand repair is strong enough to allow strong grip, that changes quickly and during the middle period of the six weeks, even the six strand repair would be questionable as to have enough strength to allow strong grip. The two-strand repair definitely allows us to have passive motion safely because that's well below. But as we already said, 
Even light active motion becomes problematic in the one to three week period of time, based on Strickland's work. Here we see with the four strand repair that there's little question whether passive motion or light active is strong enough because they're well below. But with the four strand repair, the strong grip exceeds the uh, strength of the repair, except perhaps as you move toward the six weeks range, when I would suggest you may even want to continue with some caution. The six strand repair, as we've seen, is well above the light active and the passive, but again, we would caution against strong grip until the six week period of time when there is some divergence. So the conclusions we reach from Strickland's work is that we should question and perhaps avoid early active range of motion protocols with two strand repairs. And with all repairs, the patient should avoid strong grip at least until six weeks. And in some circumstances, I think uh, it's prudent to be a few weeks beyond six weeks to assure the tendon's strong enough.